Can we not ignore that rap legend Jazz O just signed to Rock Nation? Now, you may say, what's the big deal? He's an older rapper who's probably not going to set the world on fire. That might be true, but we love and respect Jazz O. And more importantly, he was Jay-Z's mentor. He brought Jay-Z into the game. They fell out. They had a lot of beef, and you thought they'd never talk again. But one of the things Jay-Z's done in the last few years is squash those beefs, whether it's Cameron, whether it's Jim Jones, whoever. He squashed the beef and brought people back together. And now with Jazz O, things have come full circle. So here is to loyalty, here is to friendship, and here is to restorative justice. Black Coffee starts now. Welcome to BET's Black Coffee. I'm Mark Lamont Hill alongside Gia Peppers. And of course, Jameer Pond is vacationing in a remote island and he won't tell us where it is, but it's okay. <laughs> but we have Manly. instead the writer, the columnist, and the cultural analyst, Jamila Lemieux in the house. Give her a round of applause. Jamila Lemieux, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want to know about the issues that are affecting our community, you need to follow this brother. His whole career has been about justice and equality. He's a link leader, he's a thinker, he's the president of Color of Change. Yeah. Give it up for Rashad Robinson. You. you got the hat on, killing yeah, it today. Man. How y'all doing? <laughs> y'all good? Yes. yes. Yeah. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited to have y'all here. We have like real thought leaders here who are changing the culture. So we appreciate Smart people. <laughs> for coming and waking up. Exactly. And we got a question of the day that we're going to be, it's kind of the theme of the show in a lot of ways. And so we want to make sure that you all know about it. The question of the day is, with all the injustices, the harassment, and the aggression that we see toward black people every day, do you feel unsafe around white people? <laughs> Drop your thoughts, and we will read them throughout the show. So, I mean, it's, it's a provocative yeah. thing to, to think about, given all that's going on in the news. And I feel like the last couple of days, particularly people who talk about social justice, y'all have to be really wrestling with not just that question, but in general, like, where are we right now on the social justice front? I think that um, we're at a point in our history um, that... You know, I, I'd say for those of us on set, we haven't seen in our lives in terms of the um, the amount of awareness, the fact that people are constantly mm -hmm. talking about these issues. You know, most of us were, we were raised in, you know, the 80s and the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, Mark in the 70s. <laughs> and, <laughs> Shots fired. Wow. And we're off. I that usually was do that. that was I like it. <laughs> We've got a show. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, but again, that people got comfortable, people got complacent, people yeah. were dealing with the challenges of the crack era, yeah. you know, and we're not necessarily looking at the laws mm -hmm. that were be, being put into place right. uh, to do us harm. And, and people were thinking about capitalism and individual success as opposed to collective struggle and work. Yeah. Um, and thanks to you know social media and platforms like uh, the ones that we've all contributed to over the years and the work of people like Rashad, it's inescapable. Yes, mm -hmm. it's inescapable. And you know, I think the challenge that we're facing is that um, because there's so much uh, presence of those issues, we can mistake that for change actually right. happening. Mm. Because, you know, we something gets so many retweets or it's on the news and people are talking about it, we can mistake that presence for power. Wow. And power, you know, for us at Color of Change, we talk about it as the ability to change the rules. Right. And if the rules are not changing, whether they are written rules of policy or unwritten rules of culture, we can be in a position where it almost works against us having all this hyper-visibility around these issues because the status quo can be kind of almost fait complete. Like, we can almost think, like, well, there was no justice for Sandra Bland. There was no justice for Trayvon Martin. There was no justice for Mike Brown. That is how it can, it's supposed to be. It's almost a dance. Something bad happens. There's outrage. And so I do think, like, um, strategically, we have to continue to up our game right. about who we hold accountable, what enablers are not allowed to sort of occupy um, comfortable space when these things happen, um, whose um, kind of comfort is upended um, until justice is served. And unless we are doing those things, unfortunately, I think that the visibility alone um, actually can be a detriment to our ability to actually What visibility? Change. What do you mean? The visibility of us, um, the access to more information, right? You know, 10, 15 years ago, when these moments of policing would happen, we didn't actually get um, real-time stories about it, right? So sometimes I'm on news programs or places where it's like, is there... Is our, you know, is it real? Is it is police and community interaction worse than it was before? And I'm like, no, we just actually know more things than we did before. Um, you know, I hear the stories from my 
father and my grandfather and even think about like my own upbringing where something would happen and there would be no news about it. Right. There would be no information about it. So yes, because of some of the social media platforms, we've been able to bypass traditional media gatekeepers and go directly to the source. And that type of visibility has helped more people get activated, has helped uprisings happen. But without change and without rule change, um, uh, the status quo can get baked in and become even stronger. Absolutely. No, that, that's what scares me, you yeah. know, is that people, we have the illusion of change. Yes. And, and as the 2020 elections come in, there's going to be a lot more of that. By the way, uh, we have some uh, social media comments coming in. We're going to get to them in a little bit. I want to make sure that everybody, uh, you know, again, answers that question. What does it mean to live in a world where you might actually think that, uh, that, that you're not safe around white people? Right. And, and to really wrestle with that, because I feel like that's something that we're not allowed to wrestle with as black people. It's that question we don't even raise to ourselves. It, it's something that I think some of us were raised to, to think about our safety yeah. around white people, and it's not... You know, you, you've heard old black mama say things like, don't you embarrass me in front of these white folks. Yeah. You know, this, and, and it sounds on its face like, oh, are you saying we have to have a better standard of behavior or decorum when we're in the presence of these people? Are we mm -hmm. trying to, um, you know, humanize ourselves by being respectable? But it, it, it's more so a function of mm -hmm. what happens when we're disruptive, right, in, in a space with people who do not recognize or believe in our humanity. You know, how somebody could have the police called on them for you know, an argument or, or for doing something that somebody else can do you know, in public without it becoming an issue or yeah. just simply being present in certain spaces, right? Mm -hmm. The police are gonna be called on you. And yes, we've had all these viral videos of that in recent years, but you know, Pool Park pa uh, Pamela or whatever yes. cute name people wanna give her, that stuff has been going on Correct. since day one, since there have been police to call on black people, right. black people have had the police called mm -hmm. on them, you know? So we've never been safe in the presence of white people. There is an increased um, likelihood of police interaction, you know, because the idea that we're unsafe and that they have to be mm -hmm. protected from us, there's the idea that somebody can challenge your ability to just simply exist in a space or actually do you harm, mm -hmm. right? Or, or physically, it's, so many of them, and I hate to say, you know, white people, they're just so bad, it's all the white people. No, it's not that, but the number of white folks that feel comfortable policing the, us themselves. Right. It's not just about calling law enforcement. It's someone saying, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Right, why, you know, or your music is too loud. Right, right. which is what we saw in the case of Jordan Davis. Right. We see it in like, all, all these other cases, and like you said, it's happened for a long time. There's a case uh, that I do want to talk about, Elijah, uh, Elijah El Amin, right? I mean, this is the case of a 17-year-old boy who was essentially uh, stalked right. yeah. and harassed. He's at, he's, at, he's at a vending machine trying to get a snack, and there's uh, a, a, a white assailant who, who cuts his neck. He he hates he hates black people. He yeah. hates I mean, he hates every, he essentially hated every he vulnerable gay, group, he hates gay people, black people, hip hop music, hip -hop right. music. and he decides to go out and kill a black a black person. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of vulnerability is something you can't even predict. Or I mean, you're just walking down the street. Mm -hmm. You know, when I you see get some snacks, right? Yeah, and. and, and other folks have told their children not to, don't let that person get too close to you, right? right. The idea of, you know, you see a white woman in an elevator, any of us, not just you two, yeah. right? You get on an elevator with a white woman, there's a good chance she's gonna clutch her purse, right. or she's gonna press the button, you know, mm -hmm. or she's gonna pick mm -hmm. up her pace walking down the street, it's particularly at night, you know, if you're behind her. But we have to, you know, think about those things too, and I think many of us do, but a lot of us, you know, I, I just see the, the ways that we're comfortable. We trust that, you know, they're not gonna pick up your laptop or your phone if you leave it at a coffee yeah. shop, you know, that they can yeah. get right behind you or get really close to you. I think about the times that white women and men, you know, will get in my physical space as if I'm invisible. Yeah. You know, almost like they're trying to yeah. walk through me. And I just think to myself, now if a black man, or even me, you know, a, a tall black woman got this close to you, you would be so uncomfortable, you would be so afraid. And so now the idea that a 17 year old you know, who, who's thinking, if I see a 17-year-old at a vending machine, my first thought is, I hope he has enough money, and if he, for his snack, yeah. if he doesn't, maybe yeah. I need to reach for my purse. Right. You know, you're going to auntie account. mode. I'm yeah. going into cool big sister mode, right? right? And so... <laughs> auntie. Uh, yeah. Auntie. Excuse you. Excellent. <laughs> you did it right. Sorry, you did that. Yeah. No, I think it's so scary yeah. because, I mean, these are our brothers, these are our kids, these are our cousins, that these are, it's us who's being killed, and I think the, the crazy part is, at the same time, we have all these beautiful things that are happening, like Jay-Z's the first billionaire, and we've got Michelle Obama speaking at Essence Fest, talking about, you know, everything under the sun. Um, and so there's this weird balance that's happening, and it's like, some days you're celebrating, some days you're extremely sad because your presence is a threat. 
for no reason at all. This kid was putting money into the machine, and that's the scariest thing ever. Yeah. Well, it, all, it all kind of, though, works together in a lot of ways, right? The kind of, mm. uh, um, you know, uh, presence and visibility and success of black people in the space, um, the kind of um, competition for space in so many communities. Mm -hmm. We think about, you know, you think about the Starbucks incident and in Philadelphia, and you think mm -hmm. about all the gentrification that was happening um, in that in that community, and thinking about sort of the the the, the competition for who belongs, wow. who has access, and and the privilege that some that you know many white folks feel. Um, that has been afforded to them um, in this country um, to be authority over black yeah. people, to determine yep. what we should do, to question um, our existence and our ability to be in space. And that that can't be solved with policy, right? That is about how we, as people, build power to create the type of cultural consequences for that, not just yeah. the whack-a-mole consequences of a permit patty, but, like, deeper consequences. But is, is, but is, there, a Nash, is there a bigger... Um, consequence that's created when we have a permit patty or a barbecue Becky yeah. and they get sort of killed on social media for what they did. So when it becomes like a yeah. joke that yeah. you barbecue Becky, yeah. does that make white people at some point be like, yo, don't be the next barbecue Becky? Like, does the uh, social consequence kick oh, in in that way? Absolutely. I think, I think you know, you even in, um, you know, we've seen recent stories um, about, you know, where if your folks don't want to be the next person, right? right? Um, don't want to be the next person on those videos. So I think all of that does help. But at the end of today, the there's there's sort of a, um, a, a kind of a operation mode that people go back to um, that relates to them feeling like um, their safety is at stake. I also think that we have just, um, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on giving deep, long benefits of the doubt to um, this, this murderer, right? At the same time, as someone who believes that um, we have to abolish the justice system as it relates, we have to also recognize that this person left prison without the type of mental health and Absolutely. other resources. And, um, and if a white man is leaving prison without those type of things, we know what black people are leaving prison with. And those also about how are we dealing with and making the type of, like, investments that truly keep our community safe. We incarcerate 25% of the world's population, have 3% of the world's population. And so I also want to um, make sure that, because sometimes in these conversations, we instantly go back to locking these people away, right. which actually will not bring this young man back. Right. What would bring this young man back if we thought differently about the type of investments in mental health, if we thought differently about the type of investments in culture change that has to happen in our society. And that, for me, also is about what does it truly mean to have a society that is both safe and just. Yes, there needs to be consequences for this behavior, but I'm interested but in how other ways to keep to people alive. Yeah. Exactly. I want to check in with our folks on social media because we asked, again, in light of all the trauma, harassment, and over-policing black people face, do you feel safe around white people? We got some answers. I Love Me 1779 tweeted, no, you should fear no man. White, black, Spanish, Asian. White people have been doing this since forever. Police have been killing black people. This isn't anything new. It's just new that it's caught on video. They feel like they are superior or entitled. It's been that way. Dylan tweeted, yes and no. no. Not only do I feel unsafe around white people, I also feel unsafe around my own race sometimes. That, by the way, th that's an honest thing that people have to be honest about. So I remember years ago, Jesse Jackson said that. Mm -hmm. He said, I I'm embarrassed to say. He said, it pains me yeah. to say that when I'm walking down the street, and I see young people walk up out of the dark, I'm relieved when I see it's a white person. You know, and this is Jesse talking, yeah. you know. And he wasn't saying, yeah. you know, it, it, he wasn't attacking black people as much as say is that, that there is a fear yeah. that a lot of older black folk have. And I, I think it's, yes, particularly as a woman, you know, or as an older say, person, totally as a LGBT black, you know, as a black person who checks off any of those boxes, I, I think that there's a heightened fear, you know, around our safety that we're kind of required to have as a sense of responsibility when we're around some of our folks, right? Yeah. But I would also argue 
it depends where you are. So if I see a group of, of young boys behind me, I'm not relieved because they're white, you know, and, but I'm also a woman, right? And I can understand why if Jesse, you know, at that point we're walking down North Michigan Avenue in Chicago, right, that, that he would maybe mm. feel a little sense of relief because this is a group that's unlikely to be poor teenagers that are out trying to rob somebody because they don't have any money. But there are a whole lot of places in this country where a group of white, boy are, group of white boys are going to be a lot more threatening to, to one of yeah. us than, than, to, than a group of black boys. Absolutely. You know, and I think that that... You know, with, with all due respect to, to Reverend Jackson, I think that, particularly when we think about the 80s, there's this disconnect, or, and in the 70s, from our youth, and this idea that, you know, that the boys and the gangs were our enemies and not our children to protect, right. you know, in the ways that we were complicit with, the ways that they were policed. Right, and, and the description of super predators. That right. was something that we, a lot of our, our religious leaders, our activists, our you know, Absolutely. women in the community, we saw, we, we went with it. These right. are super predators. You know, you, this is what we need to do to, to stop them. But that was Hillary's argument. She was, like, black, she was like, black people hit me for the super predator thing. Y'all was asking right. for it in the yeah. 90s. Yeah. Right. You know, and this, Joe Biden's making the same argument. Now, let me just bring in a couple more comments here. Michelle Lee Evans tweeted, they say they are scared of us, but in truth, it is us yeah. who has everything to fear. Them killing us, them calling the police on us, hoping they will do the job. I'm tired. <laughs> do you all exhausted? I, I have a question. Do you all honestly believe that white people are as afraid of us as they pretend to be, or as they as they claim to be? Because I think about, and there's certainly situations where, because of the ways that we've been portrayed in the media and the ways that they've been introduced to us, that mm -hmm. they, they could see, you know, you're going to be argumentative and loud, and you might be, you know, quick to throw hands, or you know what I'm saying. But like. We watch those videos, you know, of somebody being very aggressive and confronting, you know, a young person or a group of people about a barbecue or a lemonade stand. Mm -hmm. But then when the police come, that's when the fear and the, oh, my God, oh, I'm, you know, I, I'm just so, the, you see a switch go that's on. True. I think yeah. that the, the idea of the fear is, is something that they can lean on and mm -hmm. say, I was afraid. All these yeah. police officers saying, I was afraid. I don't what believe that they're honestly afraid. I, I think, I think, I actually think many of them are afraid. I think that they've been fed media images. You know, um, we've done studies on like local news coverage where um, you compare the arrest records back to what they actually show in terms of who's been arrested. And they're, and it's being, it's, you know, the stories are being led. When I get in focus groups with black people, they talk about being afraid because of the hostile climate that sort of, depicts how black people are portrayed, it connects from the media directly to the incentive structures about what it means to need more prisons in this country, because there are people at every level that are profiteering off of what it means to um, control black people. And then at the end of the day, many white people know what they have, been, what they have done to black people. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, like if I was complicit in, in what um, has been done to black people, I'd probably be afraid of black people too because the idea <laughs> yeah. that like folks are going to come back right. and get you back for right. what you have done. Right. Um, and so to the extent that I actually do believe that, um, that, that white people are fear, uh, can be afraid, but that's actually even more reason, right, that we can't let people's fears dictate our ability to live in a safe society, um, getting our ability to be able to be healthy, the ability to society to be on our side. And so much of whether it's public policy, so much of of how our communities are created, so much of how our schools are funded, our, um, how people have access to hospital, is based um, both in this idea of holding communities back and dealing with this sort of perceived idea that some people are more vulnerable than others and deserve some sort of protection. Right. Yeah. Some people's lives are worth more yes. than others. Yeah, and, and, and that's really yes. at the core. Can, can we talk about Sandra Bland for a minute? Just because I don't want us to forget that this is the fourth anniversary of Sandra Bland's death. Uh, there was newly released cell phone footage uh, that came out a, a, a little while ago that showed Bland's encounter with police from her point of view. Um, this is, I think, again, one of the most important things uh, that we have to talk about this, this cell phone piece of it. Again, it gives us more access because at one point it would have just been this police officer's story against this black woman's story. And so often black women and girls and femmes get uh, erased from the conversation about criminal justice. We think about like police assaulting black men, people getting killed for, you know, for being black men. We, when the face of social injustice right. oftentimes is black men, but it, it's oftentimes black trans women, it's often black cis women who are getting the brunt end of, of law enforcement. Right. And I mean, the thing, and especially going back to your point, like, the problem that I have is, like, 
the day to day, like forget the systems, we yeah. all know they're messed up. We live in it every day. But the day to day realities of the fact that I could walk outside and get killed for just being, going to the vending machine, I think is one of the most fearful, like terrifying things about just being born. Like mm. you can't protect black kids from, from a mentally unstable person slitting their neck out of any machine, whether they're a girl or a boy. I think now, especially with Sandra Bland, I feel like that was one of the first major cases where we as a people were like, oh, this is happening to black women too. Right. Like, we can't just be like, oh, you know, only black men have to fear for their lives yeah. because as black women, we are often the backbones of so many societies and we're often overlooked, mm. even in our own community. Mm. And so now, you know, Sandra Bland's uh, case was just so disheartening because we had the cell phone video, yeah. but just to see literally the day-to-day -day jail footage that, that was released, it's, it's very interesting yeah. to see what will come from this new evidence. Yeah, that's a good point, you know, because I, I, a lot of times people say, well, she, she committed suicide, she wasn't killed, because that was the conspiracy, mm. or, or the controversy, rather. But the truth is, to your point, it, even if she killed herself, and I wrote a book, Nobody, where I, I cover a lot of this story, and I, my conclusion was, yeah, she, she, she likely did take her life, but it was, it was state-aided. Right. They created the conditions yes. for this to happen. You put someone in jail. First of all, you're in jail for a weekend, mm -hmm. and we, only because she didn't have the money to not be in jail. Absolutely. You know, you're talking about a couple hundred bucks for bail. She yeah. didn't have it. People, 80% of people in jails are there because they don't have enough money not to be. It's that simple. Any system where you're in jail because you don't have enough money is evil. Right. You know, and then they knew that she was likely, that, that there were things that made her more likely to commit suicide. They knew that there, there were medicines she could take that would make her less likely to commit suicide. Suicide. They, they, the the guard's supposed to come around every hour when you're suicidal or on suicide watch. They came they came around much less than that. Mm -hmm. So all the things that, that could have prevented this, they didn't do. So whether they intended for her to die or not, the point is they were indifferent to her life. And so many black women and girls have that circumstance with, right. with, with criminal justice. And then you add sexual assault to it, mm -hmm. when you add all the other, the, 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 the juvenile justice system. I mean, it's, it's, it's awful to think about and it's awful. Um, um, to watch, and, and, and I think that's why I'm, I'm so sad. There is a little bit of uh, good news we can pivot to, if you want to call it good news. Um, there are some uh, politicians, or I should say activists, and mothers, and, and, and parents in general, who have decided that their response to this is going to be to engage the system. So rather than just respond to the tragedy by mourning, which we have every right to do and we shouldn't mourn, we have people like Lucy McBath, who spoke with CBS News about how her son's death galvanized her into action. Take a look at this. How much did Jordan's death drive your decision to run for office? Jordan's death had everything to do with me running for office. My mother's mission here is just basically to take all of that concern and support and nurturing that I would still be doing for my son. I'm just channel channeling it to the people that I live among every single day. Why are so many mothers of young black men who were shot and killed running for office? We recognize if we don't stand up and champion for our communities, more people within our communities continue to die disproportionately. So, I mean, that's a good example. And again, I don't romanticize political office. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying that we can vote our way to freedom right. or elect our way to freedom or, or safety. But there is something to be said about watching people move into action yeah. and to watch people say, look, I recognize that the protest is not enough, although we need to protest, that I need to actually be in there affecting policy. And so I'm, I'm kind of inspired by watching these courageous mothers. Right. I mean, I mean, action. so inspired her, Sabrina Fulton, who's running right now, uh, Trayvon Martin's mom. Yeah, for that commission, um, You know, yeah. Lucy is a friend um, and, um, and someone who I helped work on her campaign. Um, you know, she has been tireless. And I think for anyone, for people who are watching, um, and sitting on the sidelines, right, as all of this is happening, right? If Lucy McBath and Sabrina Fulton, um, who um, every, anyone would probably totally understand if they just wanted to, like, lay under the covers and go away and not right. have to be public. Right. But decided that not only were they going to step into the fray, but do it for other people's children. Yeah. Um, it is just so inspiring, but it's also the burden that black women have carried in so many ways mm. for so many years. So I also think it's like incumbent on all of us to find out how we support these sisters, yes. how we engage and make sure that they are not sitting out there alone. Lucy is going to have an incredibly tight reelection campaign. Um, she is like basically the Republicans' number one target because she ran, she won a race that she was not supposed to be win, aided really by um, also by another black woman and Stacey Abrams and yeah. her historic run and turning out voters. Stacey didn't get over the line, but what 
what ended up happening was her coattails helped other people like exactly. Lucy get over the line. And so also the idea that we need folks in Congress right now, like Lucy more than ever, folks need to go to her website, support her in any way possible. Okay, there's two quick stories I want to talk about before yeah. I lay something heavy on y'all. All right, all right. All right, here all we right, go, right. Uh -oh. but, 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 but these two stories are actually, are actually interesting um, and important, and that is Nicki Minaj and ASAP Rocky. Right. Yeah. Okay, so first, Nicki Minaj. Um, I'm proud of Nicki Minaj, and I'm, I'm really excited about what Nicki Minaj did yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday, Nicki Minaj announced that she was not going to be performing in Saudi Arabia. Um, for those that don't know, Saudi Arabia has an extraordinarily long record of human rights violations. Mm -hmm. um, they impose a death penalty at a rate um, it, it, that would make America go down. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Without due process. Uh, women, lack of women's rights, lack of LGBT rights, the murder of Jamal uh, Khashoggi uh, last year. All of these things are reasons why you shouldn't perform in Saudi Arabia. And Nicki Minaj heard the call, she heard the protest, and instead of ignoring them, Nicki Minaj stood up and said, I am going to not perform here. I think that she deserves a salute for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, yeah. and, and I know there are people, because there were people, and this is what fr frustrates me about the social justice movement sometimes. There were people who were like, well, they all, er everybody knows Saudi Arabia's human rights record. She shouldn't have said yes in the first place. And I'm like, yo, you, you. Everybody doesn't know. I was about know. to say, yeah. everybody <laughs> doesn't <laughs> know. No. I, I, I yeah. just, I, it's interesting to see the ways that people assume. And don't get me wrong, I think you should be responsible with your platform. I think you should have people around here who, who can educate you, who can talk to you about yes. certain things so you don't unwittingly take a picture next to some sort of violent dictator because he wanted you to be at a show, right. you know? Um, but to assume that the average person yeah. would know those things, somebody who's not terribly politically engaged, is simply not true. And I'm not gonna assume that Nick, Nikki knew that before, but now that she knows and she's acted on it, I'm also proud of her. And even if she knew it made a different choice Absolutely. later. Absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely, because we have to create places. If we want people to change and change their opinions, then when they change, we can't right. keep beating them up. Right. We have to create the space for people to um, learn and grow. And if anyone thinks that they like came out the womb with everything that they <laughs> like needed to know about the world, um, then like I want to know how that happened. Ex exactly. Yeah. And we have this again. We, that's why the cancel culture is so scary because these are human beings. Whether they have a billion followers or yeah. five, everyone is a human being. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about this is like this is the Nikki that I want to see. Like mm -hmm. forget the trolling, forget the girls who are trying to come for your spot. Like you are the the top rapper and the top female rapper right now, you know, like whatever. People, right. she's You're the queen. star. Yeah. You're a star. Um, so at the end of the day, for her to say this and to actually stand up for the women and, and, and men who are fans of her over there, mm -hmm. I think is one of the most empowering things we've seen Nikki do in the past, like, decade. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah right, right, real talk. Like, and so. it will change the conversation, because yeah. now there's a million barbs out there, yeah. you know, mm. yourself included, who will be like... I'm a hot girl. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all all respect to Queen Nikki, but I am a, I'm a We stallion. all make choices, right? I'm a so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but like... Like, there's a million people who now know about Saudi Arabia. And just on the strength, the same people that'll, that will criticize you for criticizing a, a celebrity, they can now, they'll now criticize Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. You know, so when all these celebrities come out and make that move, yeah. that's what's important. Uh, the last thing, real quick, we got to talk about, because it's buzzing ASAP. on Twitter, is ASAP Rocky. Yeah, he's been, he's been held in Sweden, and now he's going on, like, two weeks, I believe. And so... He's in these inhumane conditions. A representative from the U.S. Embassy went to go visit him in the Swedish jail. Two men were following him, and he asked several times, like, yo, fam, for real, like, in his Harlem way, you might want to back up. Like, this ain't that. I'm not the one. I'm really from Harlem still. And they ended up getting into a fight. It's all on video, and so he was arrested. And now he's being held in these ugly conditions, and it's really bad. There's petitions happening. And so people want Rocky free, obviously, right. but it's really bad. A, a, a disheartening story because, again, this man was just trying to defend himself. What do you do when two people are harassing you over and over again? Your bodyguard asks them to back up. Everybody asks them to back out. They post these videos, and he's still arrested. Like, mm. I don't get this, what's happening right now. And, and, what, and, what's, and what's awful, as you mentioned, are those conditions. I mean, there was literally someone t that had human excrement throwing it around the prison. Now, the conditions of the prison are awful anywhere. There's no such thing as a, sane, a safe yeah. prison. Right. There's no such thing as a healthy prison. Right. But the, this is extraordinary, and it's bad, and I'm glad to see the rap world speaking up. I'm glad to see fans speaking up. There are some people, though, who are coming for ASAP a little bit, and they're saying, wait a minute, when the Ferguson thing was happening, you weren't speaking up. He, he gave a quote to, I believe, Time Out New York, yeah. and he Do we have said, the quote? I, um, you know... Oh. 
every, you know, they asked him, did he feel pressure to speak out about this? This had to have been 2014. You know, do you feel pressure to speak out on things like what's going on in Ferguson? This was during the uprising. And he says, look, I want to talk about my homeboy who died. I want to talk about lean. I want to talk about girls. I want to talk about my jiggy fashions. That's the direct quote. He said, jiggy fashions. We didn't hold him accountable for that then. That's the real crime. Now. But, you know, that he didn't feel connected to that, right? Well, he said, I'm not out sharp. He was, I'm not out sharp and I'm a rapper. And so I, there are people that are like, well, sorry, you you know, you you weren't here for us. You weren't here for your people. You want us to be here for you. And he hasn't called on us. You right. know, he can't call on us because he's in jail. Right. Right. But the assumption is that he would want people to be sympathetic to him mm -hmm. in ways that he wasn't sympathetic to his brother who was killed in the street mm -hmm. by Darren Wilson. I hope that this is a learning experience for yeah. him. I hope that, you know, in the way that we've seen Meek Mill become an activist mm -hmm. and, and become, you know, very outspoken about criminal justice and mass incarceration, right. that we could see the same thing happening for ASAP mm -hmm. Rocky. Mm -hmm. But whether he chooses to take that on or not, yeah, I can judge him and whether I want to listen to his music. I don't listen to his music because he said he don't like how dark-skinned women look in red lipstick. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I, I've been disengaged from, you know what I mean? Right. Like it's not something I'm a fan of for a lot of other reasons. <laughs> However, we can't say that we don't want yeah. people to be locked up for, you know, either we don't want them locked up at all if you're, mm -hmm. you know, an abolitionist or we want there to be a different standard for which we yeah. say you've done something so terrible that you need to be taken away from your home and, and unable to leave. Mm -hmm. And to, yep. to apply that to him because we don't like something that he said, right. that, mm -hmm. that, that tells me that you're not really about... Um, about yeah. that work. I mean, the, the standard for justice and for equality is not whether or not the person did all the things that you wanted them to do or whether that right. they were your best friend. If you right. actually, if you can't actually apply the rules um, and the sort of vision of justice, yep. even when the person may not be the person you want, you know, in your house, uh, right. that is, um, you know, then you're not actually doing the work exactly. of justice. Mm. But I mean, but I will say for him, he's right now sitting in a prison and he's probably thinking about this. Exactly. Of course and, he is. And, and, he and, and, I'm he, sure he regrets. Having, and he's having yeah. his own moment that is deeper yeah. and more right. painful than any than anything yeah. that like hit people when he made that comment. I live that, in Soho, Beverly like a, Hills. That was like a dot a day, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he he's yeah. learned that lesson. But and you can hit him with the "I told you so" yeah. once he comes home. Right. Uh, you can judge him when he comes home. Right. But it is our responsibility. Yeah. Justice requires that we bring him home. And sometimes right. you don't even need to say "I told you so." Sometimes you the person to. already knows. Yeah, but I'm petty. I probably would be like, oh, so I, will you mean drop me off at Soho when you yeah. get back? Right. Like, I might be a little, but I'm gonna fight yeah. to get him yeah. out just like I would right. anybody else because his life requires it, his justice yeah. requires yeah. it. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. So, we're gonna talk more about that a little bit later. Yeah. But I, I mean, I love what everyone, I love this conversation. I wish we didn't have to continue, but we do have to move on to our segment. I said what I said. It's a, a big segment that we do here at the show. Mark often gets us in trouble with his opinions. And today, we're gonna let Mark me? get us in trouble again. 60 seconds on the clock. Tell us your opinion in our uh, latest I Said What I Said, Mark. Let's go. Is the clock ready? I ain't gonna need 60 seconds. Ready. Look, I know many of you grew up watching television. Here we go. And you grew up thinking that things were good that simply aren't good. It's my job as a truth teller to tell you about one of your sacred cows. <sighs> Family matters. It is the worst piece of garbage ever created. First of all, it's a Cosby Show ripoff, okay? Black family, it's just Chicago instead of New York. It's just a working class version of the Cosby Show. So it's not even original. Next, they be disappearing kids. Where is Judy? Nobody <laughs> knows. The father wasn't an upstanding doctor like Cliff Huxtable, who we still like even though the real actor's a creep, but he was a cop. He's the feds. We can't respect that. Steve Urkel was a stalker, okay? I'm wearing you down. That sounds cute till you realize that he spends his whole life following her. He even created a robot to stalk her. He is a sick person. They disappear children. The show is evil. And it ran way damn too long. They even switched networks. And in the last episode, they got Urkel going to space. That's beyond jumping the shark. They even changed Harriet Winslow with nine episodes left. Let it go. If you like Family Matters, you are probably a serial killer. Yo, not Thank everything you. is a serial killer I, if they don't like stuff. I, no, but Mark, you're not a serial killer. But Mark, you know way you too something? much. You know way too much I, about Family Matters. Never <laughs> to hate it. Yeah. I, I see what you're doing. I, I see where you're going with this. I've, I've never yeah. seen it. No, there's something he missed, though, that he that I don't think he knows, which is that it's being rebooted. But oh God. Um, I have to say, Mark, I've known you for almost 10 years at this point. I don't think I've ever been more proud of you than in that moment. The courage 
It is a garbage show. It Thank is a you. Garbage. I think Jaleel White was one of the most gifted child actors ever. And I think he, if I'm not mistaken, I read somewhere he made, basically made enough money doing that that he hasn't had to work. Yeah. Uh, like so many other people that came out around that time. Good for him. But that show <laughs> aged like cheese. It was not funny. The jokes were what? Like, it was so bad. I can't believe that they want to bring that back. And I have. was a stalker. Yes, I have no an idea what you all stalker. are talking See, about. I you had a crush on Stefan Urkel, didn't you? I definitely had a crush on Stefan Urkel. The man was fine. I mean, everybody had a crush. Right, he was fine. Okay, but so. my thing is, I loved seeing Laura. I thought Laura was so cute to me. And she was this brown girl on television. She was. Super she cute, was girl. smart. She was about her grades. And the, I mean, come on She now. was the one I, redeeming well, thing friend, on the show. And Myra. My, and Myra God was cute. Her my best friend's dad is a cop. Like, I never felt like the feds, like he was a regular everyday middle class family man. There, there was he tased a few people and then come in the house and say hello to the family. He didn't. And then we just showed Eddie. it off camera. And he was fine. He was dumb. I but he was fine. I can't with you people. Waldo, Geraldo, Faldo. All right, he got to go. Yeah, that I mean, was, that was, was, stop it. Again, yeah, yeah, I've never seen the show once you, or twice. But you sure know, you know way <laughs> too much about the show, and that concerns me. I, I hear judgment um, in your voice. I, I thought it was a judgment no, free no, zone. No, 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 you do. You definitely hear judgment in my voice. I did not know, no, I did not know about the Urkel in space or the <laughs> Harry. That was the CBS years. Stop watching. Okay, that, that, that's, you know. You were TJF first. We'll talk about that in a refill. Everybody, before we go, we got some comments coming in from social media. Just one last time. The question of the day was, do you feel unsafe around white people? El Nora Coart says on Facebook, my answer would be no, because all white people are not alike. And for this, there are, uh, there are negative characters. I pray for those kind of people and leave it in God's hands. Amen. I think I understood that. Tessa Petaway on Facebook said, I feel safe for the most part. It's always smart to be aware of your surroundings. I teach my boys this, is, uh, this as well. If it doesn't feel right, it's not. LaShawna Hill says on Facebook, no, I don't feel unsafe around white people because not all are bad, and we have to remember there are rotten apples in every bunch, and you have to know how to pick and choose your battles yep. wisely. All lives matter. She didn't say that, <laughs> but that's what I figure you have a tattoo that says. Anyway, He's Jamila Rashad. Don't do that. Thank you for joining us. I'm <laughs> sorry. You. You're right, Jill. Thank you. I have bad behavior. <laughs> all right, Black Coffee fam, thank you for being with us, too. Remember, subscribe on our YouTube channel. Also, hit the like button on the videos after you watch them because you can see all of our episodes and the discussions. Folks are still buzzing about the conversation we had with Irv Gotti, so make sure you check that one out especially. That's youtube.com slash BET Black Coffee. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and tune in every day weekday at 10 a.m. We're going to keep the conversation going right now. It's called Black Coffee, The Refill. We'll see you there. Yo. Ooh, man. Ooh, that was a lot. That was a lot. That was a lot. It was funny.